All right, welcome back to the director's chair, our live stream discussion forum on the intersection of leadership and creativity. Two crafts and disciplines that are critical to one another, and in some ways, and in some specific examples that are obvious, such as, extreme, such as the expressly creative leadership required to realize small and large scale projects such as film or theater director, from which we've taken our name for the show here, and others that are perhaps less so, such as the ways in which our creative outlets and creative energies can indirectly and often directly influence the way that we lead and how this can help our teams and the groups that we have the privilege of serving in this capacity achieve better and more innovative outcomes in all kinds of circumstances, whether it's expressly creative or uh, an expressly creative artistic endeavor or a one in which the most creative uh, and innovative approach will enable success. And as leaders, one of our primary responsibilities and charges is to bring the energy, enthusiasm uh, necessary to create the conditions that will enable our teams to be at their very best. And in some, if not all cases, this entails finding ways to bring out and leverage individual creativity to inspire the betterment of collective outcome, uh, resulting in the, innova the innovation and growth that we seek on so many fronts. And in order to do that, we have to be at our own individual creative best. And it starts with us, it starts with ourselves. And if, and if we're not finding ways to uh, fill our own cups, to replenish, if you will, to, to kind of stretch our, our creative, uh, personal creative muscles, uh, it will be very difficult for us as leaders to be able to bring that out in others. So today I want to talk about how we do that. And as time permits, uh, then how we can in turn inspire others uh, with our own creative energy. We have a responsibility, of course, to bring that to the room each and every time. So we have a great group here. Uh, I've been looking forward to this discussion. Uh, so let's kick it off. Um, Brian, can I ask you to start us out? Um, you're a highly creative and innovative leader, um, three times CEO. You've had time to invest in creative outlets yourself. Um, we've talked about last time that, that I imagine you used to fill your cup and have inspired you in different ways throughout your career. Could you speak a little bit to how you maintain your own creative edge and maybe where you seek inspiration, how you keep your cup full? Sure. Really well. And I try to make everything fun. And I think it's the leader's responsibility to bring fun into an organization because there's something human beings want. Once you get sort of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs down, it's even Maslow. <clears throat> At the core, what people want to do in an organization, they want to make a difference. They want to they want to have purpose, but in the end, they want to have fun. So, and oftentimes leaders say, "Well, I don't know. Is business supposed to be about fun? And how do you do that?" But in order to really inspire creativity, you have to make your workplace a really fun workplace, and it starts with you. Sometimes people say, "Well, I'm not necessarily a fun person. I'm a very serious person." Having said that, if you don't find that fun, enjoying creativity in yourself, then you're not going to be able to inspire that in other people. So I'll give you just an example for me. I do a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, just like all leaders all over the world do. And so people can choose. They can do a one-on-one, -on -one, your standard format every week, and there's a, there's, a, there's a place for that. You can do a Zoom meeting. You can do a face-to-face. -face, you can sit in your office. Or you can say to someone, well, the last one-on-one -on -one was standard. The next one is you're in New York City in the park, and you say, hey, do you play chess? I don't know. I've never played chess before. Well, why don't we go to walk to the park? And let's go. Let's go play chess together. And I'll teach you chess. And we'll do one on one. What happens is when you create a different kind of environment, a fun environment, creativity is more likely to flow. An example for me: I work out a lot, not really, but I'll go to the gym on Saturdays for four hours. My workout takes about thirty-two and a half minutes, but I extend it into a four-hour workout because I bring my my phone with me. And I think about when your endorphins are spitting and flying between sets. A between set for a normal person might be 30 seconds. For me, it might be 15 minutes. But in between, I'm writing because my I'm, I've got my creativity going. I'm doing something I enjoy. I bring my phone with me. I'll write a tweet. I'll write a blog post. I'll think about my agenda for a meeting upcoming. I'll think about how to make a client meeting fun and exciting. And for me, my factory setting is how do I try to make everything fun in my life and my life and my family? And therefore, I'm able to, to move that to my professional life as well. So the part of is for me, you got to make everything fun. And that and there's um, and that that's where I start with everything. What your thoughts, guys? Brian, I, I love that. I mean, it reminds me of last week what we talked about uh, creativity in a leader. And it's that. You don't know what it is, right? But it's that little je ne sais quoi. You, you see it and you're like, I like it. I want to follow it. So I'm going to do it, right? You don't have, you might not have the exact, you know, blueprint of this is the path we're going to go down and this is where we're going to end. 
but there's something that's captivating about that leader that you want to follow that inspires something in you. And you're talking about, you know, switching things up, keeping it creative. Um, I think of when you were talking about that, that brings me back to elementary school days, just sitting in school and, and being bored. And those teachers are trying so hard to find new and energizing ways to tap into the kids, to get it out of the norm. So they're not sitting there bored, right? It's that fun. It's that excitement. It's that bringing energy to the room. And I think that, um, you know, it, as a leader, I think those under you deserve that, right? They deserve that, that, um, that creativity, that hard thinking, the ways to try and spice it up and keep it uh, everything alive and and fun. Really, I think uh, I don't know. I just really identified with your comment there. Here's something that works for me. I've been I've been saying this forever. I never take myself very seriously. <laughs> I take you seriously. I take Laura seriously. I take my investors seriously. I take my customers seriously. I take my kids and my wife. I take everyone seriously, but I never take myself very seriously. <laughs> and one of the reasons I say that is. So if that's my value, if that's part of my North Star, then because I don't, I'm willing to take more punches. I'm willing to be, be more embarrassed because I don't take myself so seriously, but it's also very important that other people know that you take them seriously. And it's a way for me, because I've worked and we all work in very serious businesses, that if you can go into it with that mindset, it allows you to, to unleash your creativity and unlock that. Yeah. But Brian, you talked about like, it, we've kind of got, gone down a thread a little bit here of like getting in the right headspace, being flexible so that you can be creative. But I want to double click on something you mentioned before and then kick it back to Tom here for a second and then to Laura, um, because I know you both spent some time releasing endorphins in very intense ways. And Brian, you talked about how when you're at the gym, you can kind of extend that into a four hour session. Um, but what you're doing is you've got your phone with you, you're taking down notes. I imagine you've got several different apps that you're using. You're taking down different thoughts that you're going to trigger to remind you later so you can maybe add something interesting, you know, to the, to the next meeting and a, an idea and epiphany you had. Um, and so there's, you know, that oft question, that oft asked question around, you know, why do our, why do some of our, our greatest epiphanies or greatest ideas come during, you know, while we're in the shower or during some other rote activity? Um, Tom, I think you spend, you spend an hour or more at the gym every morning. I know. Um, you know, I imagine that, you know, Laura, while you're in the pool, you're getting some ideas. Um, is, is that the case for you guys? And, and if so, why do you think that that is that you're yeah, getting? Sort no, of the most I, I, I love that point and I'll, I'll hog the mic and I'll kick it over to Laura because I'm, Good. she's got that psychologist background. And so I'm really interested in hearing her thoughts on this. Um, and actually Laura taught me this practice before. So everyone with me, if, if you want to, um, take four seconds and just take a, a deep breath, four seconds in and then hold it at the very top for four seconds and then let go. So one, two, three, go. I feel better already. I feel so creative. <clears throat> it's, and you can do that on repeat, right? But it's just complete relaxation. And you don't need to go into the shower, you know, to, to get that complete relaxation. All this That's the topic of this, um, of this cast right now. But that complete settling of your nervous system and everything just calming down opens up your mind to other things. You're not thinking about your phone. You're not thinking about, you know, the, in, the interactions, emails, things, what, what's going on. Like that's it just escapes your mind. It's gone. And that's what's happening with Brian, with me, when I'm working out, like that's not even in the realm of possible right now. And what it allows is like when I'm struggling day to day at my, at my job, my mind's going a mile a minute. My, my conscious mind is going a mile a minute, but my subconscious mind is working on solving these problems, right? Constantly working. I just don't know about it. I have no idea. My, my, my mind's doing a lot of great stuff. But when you're in the, those moments of in the shower or breathing deeply or exercising, that subconscious part of your mind finally comes out. The voices are always there. We're just not there listening to it. And so when that starts coming to the front of your mind, that's where those creativity and the insights happen. Not when you're rushing around wondering about notifications. I got this task, that, that. Like, there's no way you're going to be creative then. So it's that complete relaxation, working on your breath, working on whatever exercise you're doing when that creativity and those insights really from the subconscious mind come forward that you can kind of solve these huge problems. Love to hear Laura's uh, perspective on this all, from an athlete side, as well as her psychologist. Uh, and, and real quick, Laura, before you jump in there, a little bit more framing here too. Tom, I love something you said there, which was like, you're, you're pulling in the subconscious piece. And I think it was even on a, um, 
even Jim Hotelling's recent pod- podcast where one of his guests, um, Kurt Mercadante, was talking about quieting. He was like, your subconscious mind will kick your conscious mind's butt any day of the week, <laughs> right? So what what can you do to kind of quiet that for a moment? What do you do to kind of quiet that noise and just kind of keep it in the background for a while so that you can you can you can focus? And Laura, I know that like to Tom's point here, you spend some time releasing endorphins beneath the surface of the water where it's very quiet. <laughs> I'd love to maybe hear hear about you know what you what you do to to, to quiet those uh, subconscious Absolutely. or the chaos as well. Yeah, thanks. Well, first of all, uh, Tom, thanks for the little box breathing exercise. That's the four count breathing. It's thank, awesome. No, thank, thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. Um, but yes, I love this topic and, and you're so right. And there's a term in psychology. I don't know if any of you have heard it, but have you all heard of flow? Have you heard of that term flow? Sure. Yes. So for those who are unfamiliar, flow is the state that you get into when you have focused attention on a single task. And when someone's in flow, you lose a sense of time. You might even lose a sense of space because you're so involved in what it is that you're doing. Um, So a lot of artists experience this while you're drawing. I am not an artist, but I do have an adult coloring book that I love. And when I need to just relax, I'll just sit down and start coloring. Um, And it gets me into flow. Like I'll be like, I'll do five minutes of coloring. And then, you know, maybe an hour or multiple hours have gone by. Um, and exercise because it gets you into that state where you can be as focused on what you're doing or completely unfocused on what you're doing. And it's that kind of muscle memory that you have going. Um, you get into this state of just flow and endorphins are released within just 10 minutes of movement. So your actual brain biochemistry changes in only 10 minutes. Um, and so once you start getting those feel good endorphins going, you have the physiological changes, you have the nervous system changes, um, and you're doing something you enjoy ideally. Right. So absolutely. I grew up swimming. I was competitive swimmer through college and that was my flow. Absolutely. Um, still when I get in the pool, that's actually one of the things I'm struggling with right now is not having access to a pool. Um, because being in the, in the water, especially with the the sound of the water going by you and the feel of the water, the resistance of the water, um, it is one of the greatest states of flow for me. And absolutely. I come up with blog posts for myself. I'll come up with, you know, ideas for school, ideas for work, um, when I'm in that state. And then the other, my other favorite state is being on a trail, um, running because there's no one around. And it's just me and nature. And that's the time when so many ideas come. Um, because yeah, the, the task reminder is the to-do list that's all gone. It's just well, me in the water, me in the trail. You're, you're talking about <clears throat> muscle memory, right? So I think mm-hmm. we all have habits and how we get into flow. I had a coaching call this morning at seven o'clock. I have to get up at five to get into flow, do things a little differently. I have my habits, my coffee, all the other stuff. But then I'm also aware that if I keep doing things the same way, if I go to the gym and I do the same exercises again, I'm not getting the same results. I'm not getting the same spark. So how do you spark yourself? And I'll give you an example. So let's take let's take the exercise theme off of it. When I lead a meeting or a team, and I know that it's become a little stale, if we have an ideation session, as we all do, I may just create something on the fly and say something like, okay, First person who says no, I have to put a dollar into a jar. It's just a little spark. It makes the meeting a little bit more interesting and fun. But how do you and others, how do you change your routine? You get into your flow. How do you change that so you can add a little spark to it, whether it's your workout regimen or whether it's your how you create a meeting um, to, to keep people off, off on tilt a little bit, which often inspires creativity. How do you do that? It's a great question. question. Yeah. Uh, number one, that's a great question. And I, I think there is no, there's no playbook, right? Because if you have a playbook, then you're falling into that trap, right? You're, you're getting, it's the routine. Um, for me, what I love to do is I don't like, I mean, while I am, I, I naturally, I like to be a leader. I don't have to be a leader in every sense of, of every meeting that I go to or whatever. So I might say, Hey, throw the, throw the mic to somebody else. For this meeting, this is the objective. But how about you know you lead it? 
Sam. How about you read it, Jessica? Who, whatever, whatever it is, to be like, oh, okay. Well, now me having my Jessica hat on, I need to be responsible for leading this meeting. Let me try and think of what I want to do to do to to accomplish the the mission, but do it in a different way that you know might be exciting, might be you know different for other people to to come along that that journey with. But not only that, but it also empowers that individual, right? Now Jessica feels like, hey, I'm I'm leading this meeting now. So it has kind of like a, a twofold um, uh, effect. And that's one of the things that I've used in, in the past really to help kind of okay, make Tom, something a little spicier. You're a West Point graduate. You're a Division One athlete. Uh, you're a Harvard MBA. But you're also one of the rare people on planet Earth who has also been a combat officer. So without getting into the details of combat, of course, but how do you, how did you in combat actually the lull before the quote unquote storm how do you keep people creative how do you how do you spark that in the highest risks of situations where you're inspiring creativity because that's every instance is serious and every instance has its own creativity so how did you in, how did you spark problem solving and creativity in some of the highest stakes areas in the world which is combat Another great question, but one of the things that you you the diction that you used in your question was immediately at the calm before the storm, and to me that is way too late. <laughs> that is way too late. If you're if you're uh, inspiring that that calmness and that creativity, then you might as well not be cr creating it then, right? You need to do it beforehand. And for me, it's building that teamwork and that 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 network of knowing and trusting each other that's built months before that months before it and and to me what what creates so one thing that comes in common when, when we're in the shower when we're exercising when we're taking those four second breaths what's happening we are completely calm right we are a hundred percent calm and that's when creativity is able to come to our minds all the other stuff is away and that calmness is present how do you make a soldier calm in those incredibly stressful situations. And it's all that work beforehand to, for them to trust the person that's next to them, to trust themselves, to understand in their training to be 100% calm. Uh, we talk about tunnel vision. I know I'm going on tangents here. Tunnel vision, right? When you're not calm, you get that tunnel vision and all you see is this little narrow thing. Your breath gets shallower and it's just disastrous, right? You're not flexible, you're, you're stuck, you're frozen. But you need to escape that by finding that creativity, that calmness, that breath. And I think that, so how do you do that in a combat situation? It's, you don't do it in the combat, you do it way before a hand. Um, There's something yeah. that you keep saying, you've used the word over and over and over and over again. And as is often happens, people say things far better than I do. And that word is trust. One of the reasons I say make everything fun, because I'm building trust. Because if, if as the leader of a group or a follower in a group, if, if it's, if, if you don't build that trust, people won't ideate, they won't talk, they're gonna worry about punishment. And so how you create that trust, in my case, I try to make it fun, I try to make myself the focus of it, of all the jabs, of all the fire, if you will, so it relaxes other people. If the leader, if the boss in this case, is creating a fun environment and taking shots, that creates the kind of environment where I'm probably more willing to participate in. From a, from a psychologist's point of view, how do you, can you give us some ideas about Laura, about how you might build trust in the creative process and how you might uh, go about that? Absolutely. Well, one thing that I think is really interesting is I'm seeing some pretty similar perspectives, but maybe framed a little differently. So Brian, you mentioned that you make it fun. Um, and then Tom mentioned that he would pass on the leadership duties for the day, right? So he's cultivating that kind of empowerment He's entrusting others to be the leader and to take the stage. He's giving them a sense of autonomy. He's giving them a sense of confidence in themselves. And it's interesting because when you asked the question to Tom and I about, you know, how would we, um, how would we make it fun? How do we break up the routine, keep it from getting boring? I was thinking kind of the same thing of Tom, but maybe framed a little differently. I would teach. I would teach what I know to others to empower them to be able to do the same things. That keeps it interesting for me because it, it's kind of like an instant check of, 
do I actually know how to do this? Like it's muscle memory. How do you do this? How do you teach someone who doesn't already have this skill or this knowledge? Um, but then you're also entrusting the people around you to be able to have the same skills, to be equipped so that they have that aplomb, they have that ability, whether they're on the front lines or in the boardroom, and they know that they can navigate it because they've built these skills into their tools, tool set. And uh, they had a leader who was helping to cultivate that and encourage that. So to me, you know, the best way to instill trust and also build your own credibility as a leader is to empower others to also lead and to also have the skills and the knowledge to be able to do whatever it is that you know comes their way. Um, and Tom's absolutely right. We have to be able to learn these things in a calm environment where we can learn, right? Because when you're all tense and you're all stressed, you can't learn. Right. You need to be relaxed. You need to trust the environment. You need to be comfortable. You need to be in your living rooms, right? Or your home office. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you can cultivate those skills. Laura, that's really good. I, and I want to I want to bring it back to to uh, to something that uh, that Brian hit on very very early on in the conversation, which was like, you've you know in those environments when you're coming in. Um, and you're, it's, it's up to you to kind of, and Tommy spoke to this a little bit as well, like your responsibility to create that very safe place where everyone can be calm and relaxed, take a step back and have, be empowered, Laura, to your point, to, um, to, to, to be, to be creative, that it's, that it's okay to, for us to be calm and not totally urgent all the time where everything's just, that, that's, that creates an environment of stress. So we can't be redlining all the time, which is something that, that I've only learned recently in my life. And so um, I'd be curious on an individual level, like again, this is like, how, how, do we, how do we focus on ourselves and take care of ourselves to ensure that we come in our best selves? How do we, what are some things that, that you do at an individual level to maintain your energy level to bring that to a meeting? And like, Tom, I've even thinking like, you know, leading 50 combat officers, uh, leading your team and that many, you know, that many soldiers under you um, in situations where you know you're going to be, you're, need, you're going to need to be on. You're coming in to build trust, but you're coming into a room where they're expecting a lot of energy and you're going to have to have high energy all the time. What are some things that you would do for yourself to ensure that you can turn it on? You can be on when you sort of like, in Brian's case earlier in his career, step onto the stage all of a sudden. You've got to do some things that get you hyped up and ready to sort of step in that room, even if you have to be calm. You've got an energy level that you can maintain and infuse and inspire and create the curiosity that I think Brian hit on our very first session, like a leader's responsibility is to uh, inspire curiosity in others. What are some things that you do to make sure that you're on and ready to do that? So tell I took, me, a, me, uh, I took a page out of uh, the Cool Runnings movie where I look in the oh, mirror and I go, you're good goodness. enough, you're bad enough, and gosh darn people <laughs> like you. Um, so I give myself some great pep talks. <laughs> No, I'm only kidding. Um, I only do that sometimes. Um, no, um, honestly, you watch you watch Cool Running for, for everyone. <laughs> yeah, for everyone listening, please watch it. It's a fantastic movie. Um, for me, it's a so exercise is huge, right? You get the endorphins going. Uh, you don't. It's like for me, it's like you almost like package it up in a bottle. And it's like there all day. Like it's just in, in your like in present in your body somewhere. And you can kind of unleash it or, or what have you. But um, one thing you could do, I mean positioning just the way that you hold your body right those breaths getting getting to yourself in that uh, that place of calm also having check-ins right having a check-in and saying all right i'll put five minutes on my calendar after this long stressful meeting let me just you know collect myself understand five minutes of really digesting things that are going on in my head what's going on in the outside world how do i make sense of it create that period of calm Create that period of being in the shower without getting myself all wet and be a little bit more uh, uh, mobile. Uh, but you know, it's just creating those moments where you can reflect on things for a little bit. And how might you approach the last hour-long meeting differently? What could you have done? And, and it's just really constantly getting—I don't want to say getting your head, but reflecting on the good, the bad, and what you know could have been done maybe a little bit better. And so it's that constant sense of like an improvement and not being complacent and rushing to the next thing. It's being very systematic about how you approach your day and your tasks. Yeah. Tom, uh, there's a question that came in and, and, and the question is, how do you create space for creativity? And I always tell people, never apologize for blocking out your calendar 
And it can be a full day to think and be creative. And especially in this world, especially the startup world, where you have this transparent calendar culture in many places where everyone can see the, the calendar of your peers and the CEO, and we can debate whether that's right, wrong, or otherwise, but this transparency around calendars. So people are nat sometimes naturally bent to, I better fill it up so people can see that I'm really working. So when it comes to creating space, Never apologize for creating space in your calendar for fitness and for working out. People who work with me never apologize for that. Hopefully, you're working with people who go, you're going to the gym? That sounds great. Think of something <laughs> great. Or I notice that you have, I don't look at people's calendars, never have, but people look at mine all day if they, if they, if they find that joyful. And put on their creative time. So you have to be disciplined and intentional. Sometimes think of things happen naturally through your habits, working out and all the things we're talking about, but never apologize for filling your calendar. And there's always enough time for everything, providing that you do something called forward planning. So plan for creative space in your calendar. Put your work on, to make your, if, if working out your thing, make that a sacrosanct as a meeting with your boss. Because if it makes you feel good, it makes you more creative. So. That's just my response, and I do that all the time. And I'm never embarrassed about filling my calendar with a workout. I had a boss once many 15 years ago. My favorite, one of my favorite bosses of all time, his name was Bill. Many, and he's a tough guy. One of the reason one athlete. And he said, I was in Boston. He said, Kimmy, you work it out at my time. And he probably said something colorful after that. And I simply said, yes. Um, it's going to make me better at work. I'm more creative. And do you like my results? So that's one way to do it, schedule it. But do you have any other ideas in addition to that? Uh, number one, what do we, I, I keep bringing up, bring, going back to this. We are the most creative when we're, at, when we're calm, right? When we're calm. And so it, it's all about building that teamwork. And you're not going to get the max creativity out of someone. And this is a great comment that somebody has on the side. You know, how do you create that space for creativity? It's by creating that demeanor of calmness and of comfort and of confidence within an organization. If you're all uptight and you want to make sure you're doing the right thing, you're not being creative. There's no way. Uh, you just can't do it. And so by building that teamwork by Brian, I know you brought it up by, by like cracking jokes about yourself, by making it more a little bit, a little bit lighthearted where people where it's OK to fail right to an extent, learn from it and move on. But creating that that atmosphere where people don't feel like they're under the, the microscope and the spotlight 24 seven, it really makes that calmness apparent and makes them able to get to their creative self. And so that's, I mean, that's one thing that I do is just try to make that environment as comfortable and as calm as possible so that creative sp space in everyone can come out. Yeah. Tom, to your point as well, like um, uh, if, if you at the top are doing that, you're making space for that, those under you, of course, will, will follow suit. And I think, you know, Brian, to your point of don't apologize for blocking space on your calendar. It might be uh, our responsibility then as leaders. And so uh, Jackie's just weighed in here. And of course, a good reminder that, you know, ask nothing of those, uh, ask, ask nothing of those you lead that you're not willing to do yourself or should be doing yourself, frankly. Um, and so blocking some time for ourselves and clearly labeling that in the transparent culture that we have, Brian, of like, this is creative time or some call executive time uh, that we're doing out at the top, that's, that's expected of everybody. That we take a breath, that we're not scheduled back to back to back all day long. It's just and, not. And not you know, as we talked about before, at least for me, I'm not sure that I've had an original thought in a long, long time. And my punchline is this. Most of the ideas and thoughts I've ever had, I'm borrowing from you and other people. And I've never, I've, I would give credit and I never apologize for it. Now, here's a punchline. There's a guy named um, John Wooden who used to coach UCLA basketball. They've had 11 championships. And when he talks about creativity and being in the moment, he talks about timeliness and he talks about preparedness. So I start talking about, ah, make it fun. Yes, I do that. And sometimes people can out that, that you're not as prepared. In every meeting I've ever been to, almost 90 plus percent of the time, I'm the first person there, sometimes 15 minutes early, not because I'm trying to teach anyone any lesson, because I'm trying to calm my brain. Everything you guys are talking about. While other people, and John Wooden talks about this, other people coming to a practice or a meeting, and they're trying to get in the Zoom um, late, or they're trying to get in these, and they, so they're 15 minutes into a meeting before they, the meeting has passed them by, because they may be on time, but their brain is not set. So I say, 
creativity is also about also about being prepared. And being prepared means set your clock for 15 minutes or even half hour before a meeting. Create, get started in some way. Be 10 or 15 minutes early because it settles your brain and you're allowed to be more creative and, and more productive. And preparedness, preparing to be fun, preparing to be in flow, as you're talking about, Laura, and preparing and how you build trust. That's all about preparing. That takes strategy. So creativity is often about as much about strategy as, as, as much as it is about spontaneity. Yeah. Um, so I, I, we're, we'll, we'll run out of time before we know it, but I, I, um, I'd love to selfishly uh, shift here a little bit um, because I'm curious about hobbies. I don't have many hobbies myself. I want to pick up some more hobbies. Um, and I'm curious about what this group does here. Laura, you talked about coloring. What are some things mm -hmm. that we do, um, which, you know, selfishly with two young daughters at home, I, I spend a little time doing that, but not really. I really want to. Um, I'm curious as to what, what, uh, what all of you have done in your off time when we're indirectly and perhaps even unintentionally in some ways preparing ourselves to just or condition ourselves rather to be creative. I mean, interesting, like you've got to create environments to be calm. We're talking about creating the space to be um, to be creative, largely with groups and teams. But in order to maintain our own creative edge um, and, and create an outlet for creativity to flow, what are some things that we do? Um, like, Brian, I know you've, 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 uh, you're, you're a trained actor. You've spent some time on stage, and we've talked a little bit before about how that's helped you in other ways. But what are, um, I'm curious as, if, as to whether or not that's something that you've, you've maintained over time, and if, that's, if that uh, is something that has helped you um, uh, just frequently be able to uh, be naturally more creative or, or keep that energy up, and you know, some of the other, other hobbies here that uh, you've been able to maintain. I'll go ahead and start, and I'll start with music. I never, I never, I, I didn't grow up, I grew up relatively poor in the south side of Chicago, so I always wanted to take an instrument. So I'm 54. So when I turned 44, the local middle school teacher, Brian Princing was his name, and I went up to him someday and I said, I have this piano in my house. We bought it. It's a really nice piece of furniture. No one plays it, but I'd like to learn how to play. And he said, how old are you? I said, I'm 44. And he goes, I'm not taking on a 44-year-old student. He's a nice guy. He's a friend of mine. I'm not taking a 44-year-old student because you won't play. I mean, you won't practice, you won't do it. So at 44, I said, just trust me. I'll be playing whatever pop song you put in front of me in three weeks. So he came over and I started taking lessons. I, I'm horrible and I've spent <laughs> a fortune, a college tuition on piano lessons. But it's, it's a creative outlet. And at 44, I said, why not me? I'll go ahead and take piano lessons. And at a, at a, at a minimum now, I appreciate music and musicians more than I ever have in my life. So... If you don't have things outside of work, then um, I'm gonna be blunt, I kind of feel sad for people. Um, and that's also intentional. You have to have things outside of work because jobs pass. We all know right now in the pandemic, this, this health crisis, jobs pass, people pass. If you don't have habits outside of work, you're positioning yourself to not, not be as effective and creative in work. So for me, that's just one example, taking piano, um, at 44 and continuing on since then, I'm horrendous at it, but it's been a nice creative outlet. I hope, uh, I hope maybe you might play for us on a, on a future session, Brian, as well. I'm going to have to change it. Well, I'm going to tell you something. So I had a national sales meeting many, many years ago when I did this piano thing, and we were talking about this. I had challenged them, the whole company previously, to learn something new outside of work. And I had just started taking piano lessons three weeks or something like that previously. I had mm. very few lessons. And I had a piano I hope, on stage. I hope everyone knew that too. And they did know that. Okay. I had a piano on stage and I played 45 seconds, but it still sounded pretty good, of Imagine by the Beatles. Oh, nice. The whole idea okay. was I was I was my hands were shaking <laughs> you know, on the stage and and you know there's probably two or three three thousand people there. I was trying to prove a point. Put yourself out there, try new things, and if it's not great, who cares? You know, pick yourself up. 45 seconds was pretty good at that point. But yeah, I'd be happy to play piano for you at some time. But I'll need about 40. I, 
I need a little practice, but I can certainly do. Can That's practice. a good choice too, Brian. Yeah. Imagine by the Beatles to kick it off just properly. It's right. good. <laughs> Laura, Laura, can I put you on the spot? Can I put you in the, yeah. Director, the director's yeah. chair for a minute? What, what else do you do? You, you, you color, how does that help you? What else? Absolutely. What else do you do? Um, well, I actually also play piano. I grew up playing piano and viola and I unfortunately sold my viola, but I've been thinking I need to go pick up a violin, viola, or cello again. Um, the good thing about viola is it's a, a totally different clef. It's an alto clef, and then with piano, you can read treble and bass. So um, you can pretty much play any instrument if you play those two instruments, because you can read all the, all the clefs. Um, so music, absolutely. Uh, piano is probably the most calming for me, but like I said, I'd like to get a string instrument here soon. Um, but I also write, I'm a big writer. I've been journaling since I was maybe six or seven. Um, I have a blog. I teach kids to swim. Um, I'm an ultra runner and a triathlete. So I kind of, I need to have a lot of different outlets, but I think the thing that's really important and creating space for creativity, especially right now with everything going on is to find what you love, right? So find, maybe it's meditating. Maybe it's going for a walk with a dog or the kids. Um, maybe it's learning a new instrument or a new language. Um, or maybe it's like, hey, I want to learn about a very specific industry or point in history. Something that's engaging, that kind of takes you out of everything going on in the world right now and out of your work mode um, and just gets you interested. It gets you into your like creative, calm headspace for 30 minutes, an hour every day um, and schedule it as Brian said, make it an appointment that is as important as an appointment with anyone else. You wouldn't cancel an appointment on someone else. Like, why are we always canceling appointments on ourselves? <laughs> Be relentless so, and protective. Great absolutely. Point. You have to put in your calendar and you have to say, this is important. I'm doing it. Um, maybe it's a, a bath, you know, like whatever it is that gets you in that state of relaxation and just makes you feel cared for and makes you feel grounded. Um, and I, or if you're like me, find a lot of different things that all scratch a different itch and and just kind of like let you work different parts of your brain. So it's impressed me, Laura, just how well rounded you are. It makes me feel um, motivated. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Laura, it makes, me, it makes me feel a little less. Yeah, I'm glad it makes you feel uh, motivated. It makes me feel worthless, but. Uh, yeah. uh, no. <laughs> Tom, Tom uh, any any thoughts on your? And I'm curious, like you're you're. Many people would look at your background who don't know you, like Laura and, and Brian and I know you, and say like you know again you know West Point grad, Harvard MBA, everything that Brian outlined before, combat officer. Doesn't sound like the most creative of outlets as well, but I know that's not true. Um, I know that you've, among other things, taken up bhangra dancing and choir. Uh, <laughs> what are some other things that maybe we don't know about Tom Dunn? Well, I really pulled the wool over your guys' eyes, didn't I? <laughs> nah, I'm only kidding. Um, and, and actually, it's a great point because I've considered myself for the longest time, not, I'm not creative. There's no way I'm not creative. Yeah, that's just, that's the trap that I fell into. And anyone listening to this, don't fall in that trap, right? It's a complete lie. Like there are many different forms of creativity. I grew up, my oldest brother, incredible, incredible artist, is a doodler and my middle brother, they just doodle stuff all the time. And then, take five minutes and it looks like a Picasso work. I'm like, what, what the heck, what, what, what did they get that I don't like? I'm not creative, this is why I even try to, to be creative. That's one outlet of creativity and there's many, many different outlets. And so I, number one, I just would challenge anyone listening to this to really figure out well, you know, what it is that makes you, that brings that calm, that is creative, that gets, you know, juices flowing in your head. Um, Cause I guarantee you everyone's got it. You just gotta figure out what it is um, for me. I love cooking. I love food. You know, like I, I am a huge fan of food. And I think that comes uh, in from different sides. So like, number one, I love to eat, right? I love food. Um, and number two, I love cultures, right? So you mentioned Bhangra dancing, like it, that's some pretty crazy, uh, you know, Indian dancing that, that, that I did in business school. Um, but it's learning something new. It's learning something about a culture, right? And, and part of that is, is you're, it's intriguing. You learn something that's different and talk about creative. You learn about something that they do things completely different than you. And does that make them wrong? Does that make them right? No, it just makes them them. 
Um, and so I love kind of taking these different pieces and, and making, molding myself to a better person, being creative and saying, oh, I want a little bit of this. Well, I'll take a little bit of that. What about this, right? I'm going down the shop, down the, 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 the cart uh, with the shopping cart in the, in the store. Um, and so cooking, I love cooking. I love it. And you're incredibly creative, but I'll tell you what I don't love doing. I don't love baking. Baking is incredibly <laughs> precise, incredibly precise. <laughs> and you're following it's prescribed. And it's, or I, hate it. yeah. Yeah, I don't want it. I, I will not be a baker. I never will be that, but I will be a cooker. Let me tell you, I'll be a cooker and maybe I'll throw a little bit more olive oil in there. Maybe I'll put a little more spice or whatever it is. It's, you're not right or wrong. It's a creative thing. It's a little bit, Oh, this culture uses this spice. Let me try this one out and throw it in a, a meal ne uh, next week. And so it's really like, you know, picking things apart and really seeing like, Ooh, let's try that. Let's try this. And at the end of the day, I get to, I get to eat it. So that's a great example. Win -win. Tom. A quick tangent here. I'm out of curiosity. Um, even if you slightly overcook your scallops, which or so I've heard, uh, <laughs> what is, what is the, what is the, what is your favorite dish that you've cooked? And, and maybe one that required a little bit more, uh, time and attention and, and maybe you got a little bit more innovative with. Yeah. So it's a, a, a labor of love sometimes, but I, I enjoy and often doing it. That you love, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. So one of the things that I, I love to do, like I like to like, it's not just about the main meal, right? You have to have the beginning, you know, the, the appetizer, the main meal, the whole thing. And so I did a, it's a labor of love to do, um, goat cheese stuffed dates wrapped in brisciotto. Um, and so, yeah, so it's just, a, it's a whole process, you know, you have to cut the dates, you have to pit them, you have to throw everything in and cook them, wrap the whole thing, uh, you know, get the, um, the toothpicks wet so they don't, you know, catch fire in your oven. Um, but I, that's like incredibly fun just cause you're, you're constantly tinkering and like, you can see a, a thing come to life. Um, I love, uh, I love salmon. I love making salmon just because you can do it so many different ways and you, it's hard to mess it up. Um, and so I, I do a really, I think, a really nice teriyaki glazed uh, salmon on a, on a wood cedar plank. Um, and that's one of the ones that I love to go to just because it's, uh, if you do it right, it's moist, it's got a lot of flavor, and it's just pow. <laughs> well, when, we, when we can travel again, Tom, I'm going to say oh, that we, 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 need to, we need to choose a location that's convenient where we'd have a kitchen in which you'd be comfortable. Um, in which you'd have the tools that you need so that you could, uh, Perfect. you could maybe, we could see you at work here. I would love it. And that's one of the best parts about, I think cooking is it's very, it's extremely social, right? I talk about culture and bringing in different cultures together. And if you go to a, go to, I challenge people when you go to your next party, where are most people hanging out? They're not in the TV room on the couch. They're around the Island where all the food is, right? That's the, how you make a party and make everyone really come together is that food. And, and I'm telling you, next party you go to, are people in, in the couch where the seats are? And everything? No, they'll be in the kitchen by the food. Um, and so it's a really social thing. And I, I love it. I love sharing, you know, cooking and telling stories while doing it. I think it brings out the best in people. Yeah. Speaking of stories, I'm going to make a quick plug for like, this is going to be a little, um, I would have said like uh, maybe even six to nine months ago, an unusual plug for me. Uh, but Tom, speaking of like social activities in which like, you know, it's kind of, Create, create your energy and, 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 and get comfortable. I'm naturally a huge extrovert. And, you know, I, I would prefer those environments. Um, and, uh, and so I'll, I'll make a plug here for a more introverted sort of activity, which um, I've talked to Tom, you and Laura have uh, I've ref referenced this more recently, um, reading fiction specifically more recently. I, I went for like a seven years probably without reading any fiction at all. It was just all nonfiction. It was any time it was going to be things that would just help sharpen my mind or at least more directly as I thought. And I've more recently picked up even some older books that I love and have just like have been reading a little bit. Um, and again, shared with 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 uh, with the group before just some of the the direct benefits of of uh, of putting yourself in someone else's shoes, putting yourself in the midst of a story, imagining a world. Um, and just the outlet that that is for a reducing stress, um, cultivating a nice environment for sleep, of course, as well uh, to replenish yourself. Um, but then also just just generally fun too. And it's not something again I made much time for. But I'm 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 finding uh, I'm finding joy in more introverted activities while we're under uh, under uh, quarantine here. As yeah. Well. If anyone has any questions about the Avengers or anything about Marvel, <laughs> go to Dan. He's the one. He's our superhero in the group for sure. Going back to your cooking ideas, so you're in meetings with people and friends and 
and you're trying to add spark, if, if I had a team member like you say, listen, um, oh, you like to cook? Our next team meeting, our next creativity meeting, we're going to go rent out a kitchen or you can come to my home. And we're going to do the whole meeting over. We're going to cook a meal together. Either you're a chef, you can show us how to do your favorite meal, or we can rotate who does their favorite meal. Well, there you go. It's as, that, it's, it's, it's as simple as that, but it's always looking for ways to spark things within your team, just like your cooking idea or a book club idea, that, as Daniel was just mm -hmm. talking about. And it just, just comes to you. But if your factory setting is how do I add spark and, and break up the routine with my team, you're going to spark more creativity. And you're going to solve more problems. You're going to have more interesting products and technologies, and it just works out. Yeah. Um, before we might head toward wrapping up here, Brian, to your point here, I, I love the way you're uh, – Tom, I hadn't heard anyone use the term diction in a while. I appreciate you dropping that in. But the diction <laughs> you used there, Brian, on changing your factory setting um, – I'm curious as to, can you speak briefly and then Laura, maybe even from, from, uh, from your, your, your training in applied psychology and, and Tom, any thoughts like on what do we do to change our factory setting? What, to get our default setting back to, um, back to that state, what am I going to do to make this more fun? What am I going to do to kind of create an environment that's going to be more fun and exciting? If we don't get ourselves into that, that headspace all the time, we're going to bring it back to headspace. Um, what are some things beyond what we've discussed that we can do? I'll offer one small thing, if you don't mind, then I'll turn it over yeah. to um, the rest of you guys, is oftentimes people wait and see in meetings, and they wait and see in life. And then those moments pass you by, and the meeting ends, and you didn't participate, it, nothing happened, you didn't contribute. So try the best to be the first in. Engage early in a meeting, even if it's not great, but you just gave everyone else in permission, in the meeting permission, to get going. So just engage early in a meeting. It's a way to uh, change your factory setting. If your factory setting is wait for the wave, wait for everyone else to participate, come in when it's safe, which is almost everybody. But if you if you, you could change your factory setting by coming in early and maybe you're prepared with something, but you come in early. Real quick comment on that, Brian. What I love about you go to any, you know, briefing or, or a conference and even at the very end, everyone goes, is there any questions? Nobody raises their hand, right? Nobody raises their hand. <laughs> but then that first person raises their hand, and then before you know it, everyone's hands up, right? And so I, I love that part, Brian. Like, don't be afraid to throw your hand up and ask that question, right? Break the mold. I love that. Yeah, that's good. Laura, any thoughts on your end? Yeah. Uh, oh, so many, but um, <laughs> I'll try it for the sake of brevity. I mean, I think that's such a great suggestion, Brian. I think that, you know, just there are no bad ideas, right? And diversity of thought is what ultimately leads to innovation. Um, I was actually talking with one of our other colleagues the other day, and I was saying, you know, we gotta, we gotta channel our inner Steve Jobs, because, um, you know, one time there was a question of, you know, if he had asked people, all right, so what do you think the next phone should be? People wouldn't be thinking of an iPhone, right? They would be thinking of the um, landlines. I was like, what are those called? Um, <laughs> they would be thinking of a landline, right? And like maybe it's a landline with like a different type of button or, you know, like one like new functionality. Um, but he didn't even like think in that terms. He was like, I'm starting over, I'm throwing the playbook out. Like this is something completely new. Um, but the best way to have that is with collaboration, right? So if that first person raises their hand and empowers everyone around them to raise their hand, it starts a discussion, right? Like, I mean, we're seeing that right now. Someone says something and everyone else is going, oh, that's right. Like, I wouldn't have thought of that. Or, oh, that's right. Like, I come from it at this angle because this is my experience or this is my education. And so absolutely, Brian, you have to sit at the table you have to just like express your idea because that's what gets this kind of snowball effect going. That's what creativity is. That's what innovation is. And we all have a boss and we all in the end want to look good for our bosses. We want to make our bosses look good. And a good boss is going to notice who comes in early. Even if what you say is way off base, <laughs> um, a good boss is going to understand that what you're doing even strategically sometimes is giving pe other people permission to participate. And, you know, that, that stuff goes a long way to uh, uh, for your career, really. So I'll, I'll give my quick answer of, for the reset part. I don't think, for me, it's not as much of, oh, let me do this, and then I'll, the, 
automatically I'll hit, I hit that button and I'm good, right? What I do is I don't hold on to mistakes, right? By no means do I hold on to mistakes. So at night, I'm a big reflector, right? And I mentioned like five minutes after a meeting, I'll reflect and I'll take the lessons learned from that, but then I'll throw it away, right? I'll throw it away and it's gone. That's that's it's, it's past, right? It's, it's history. You can learn from it, which is why I spend those five minutes. But then after that, who cares, right? It's not a part of it anymore and you need to, you learn from it and you move forward. But if you hold on to it and you dwell on it, there's zero good that can come from that. And so by constantly trying to, you know, do that reflection and then let go, it lets me, in a sense, hit that reset button. I'm not dwelling on it anymore. I got this new lesson, you see it as an, an, an advantage. I now have this new lesson learned that I can take with me, but the rest, the baggage is, is gone, right? Yeah. And so for me, I'm a new person going forward. I have this new toolkit, this new idea, this new way of doing something in my mind, in my, you know, my skill, but the, the baggage is gone. And so it's not as much as like hitting a reset button and getting back to the beginning, but every day I wake up, it's a new, I'm not, I'm not stuck on the, what happened in the past. Um, I try to really look at, you know, possibility and, and making the future as bright as it can be. Tom, I really appreciated the way you put that. Cause I, I have to, you just shifted my thinking here a little bit because I came into this thinking like, how do we fill our cups? As I mentioned at the beginning, but you've also reminded us how important it is to flush out the bad at the back end and release our, you know, release the things that, that are no longer matter um, so that we can have space <laughs> to fill it in with the right things as well. So we have, we have two athletes here. Um, I played one at one point in my life, but Tom <laughs> and Laura, and I suspect every coach you've ever had has said, forget that last play. You got to create amnesia. Forget about it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You, you think you said something stupid in the meeting. You think you made the wrong play. I need you to take amnesia right now and keep on firing, keep on moving. Um, Dan, you were going to say something? Oh, no, I was going to, I was going to uh, comment just that uh, I'm walking away from this feeling inspired a little bit too. In fact, I think uh, it was a uh, Jackie who's watching right now. She had just mentioned Brian that uh, she just picked up piano lessons herself. And so um, on so many fronts, I'm, I'm coming away feeling inspired, but it's also, uh, yeah, inspired to find some ways to, to, um, to take up a few of the hobbies that Laura, again, I think, you know, Tom was, Tom and Brian were braver than I. Yeah. You, you've, you're very well rounded. I'm, I'm, I'm motivated and also feeling a little inadequate right now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not my intention. Look at my job is done. I'm in about six minutes, and you've inspired me even even more so, Morris. Thank you. <laughs> good. Well, I just want to can I throw one thing in because Tom too. touched on it, and it's uh, it kind of went back to the question about resetting. So one thing that I really like to think of, and I've uh, I kind of think of myself as like this metaphor of a snake. So what does a snake do? It sheds its skin every year. And that's kind of what we have to do to grow and learn, right? So like the snake or any reptile, right? It has this new fresh skin, but it's stronger, it's better, it's more experienced. It might have scars, um, but in being able to shed its skin, it has become it's newer, newer, better version of itself. And that's kind of what Brian and Tom like made me think of is, you know, and this is how I think of life and like myself, I'm one big walking metaphor. Um, <laughs> but like, that's what we have to do, right? We have to constantly be moving forward and evolving and growing and developing. And uh, so think of that snake and think of shedding your skin because that's weight you don't need, right? It's that's not Laura, I love that. I love that. We don't often like uh, we don't often think of snakes in the most positive light, but I will I will forever be looking at them in a different light. Yeah, well, and I and I loved what you did there, too. You told us a little story about that also, which is very appropriate, because next time when we jump in, I think we're going to talk a little bit about storytelling and the art of perfect. doing that as well. Um, but guys, thank you. I, I'm, I'm always coming away from these things, just really enjoying this and this group. And um, and my cup is full. I think walking away from this. So thank you for that. And but thank you guys for being willing to jump into the director's chair with this uh, as well. And thank you uh, to everyone who's joined us today, Ihab and and uh, and Vanessa and Jackie and, and even Mike, who's on the treadmill right now, releasing some endorphins. <laughs> yes, Mike. So, <laughs> good. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you everyone. Take care. Be safe. Bye now.